To my darling Farai, this is by far the second toughest letter I have ever had to write. The first one being the one I wrote in your honor to be read by Omagazi at your memorial service. I meant everything I said, and I mean everything that I'm about to say to you now. This is our story. I met Farai Spanda, um, I think March 2015. I had um, gone to get myself a pizza. It was a Friday night. And I just felt like having a night in by myself. And I walked into a pizza store um, to order, you know, my pizza. And as soon as I walked in, there was this electrifying feeling that I felt as soon as um, I I saw this tall, dark, and dare I say handsome man um, look at me. And the rest is history, really. About two weeks later... Um, I had actually even forgotten that I had met this guy and I came across his number on my contacts list and I remembered, oh yes, there was that guy that I met that wanted to, um, you know, do some drinks or whatever that he had suggested at the time, but I was not really keen. And I, to be honest, I didn't really want to show him that I was also kind of keen, but, um, I sent him a text to say, Hey, you remember me? Um, I'm that girl you met a few weeks ago. And he's like, wow, I've been waiting to hear from you. How you been? And um, he said, okay, you haven't called, um, but now that you have texted me, do you mind if I take you out on that date that I asked for? And um, I agreed. I obliged. And so when I met him, I definitely describe him as quite reserved, quite shy, and um, very domesticated, if I could say. Um, I had not really met a guy who could uh, like do all things for himself. His house was quite clean. He cooked for himself. And in fact, that date... Um, it was a lunch date initially, and then uh, I think the same week, uh, the follow-up date was him cooking for me. And I remember thinking, wow, this guy is, is quite solid, you know, seems like he's got himself together. And um, as time went on, I went to find him to be quite outgoing and um, quite loving, you know. Uh, he he was never quite shy to display his love in different ways. And um, I drew closer to him through, um, you know, forming a friendship that, um, yeah, I really think was the basis of our relationship. Uh, when it comes to the our, our Perfect Wedding Presenter search, it was a Sunday night and he had been sitting beside me, if I'm not mistaken, as we were watching the show. And um, soon after that, there was an ad about, are you like the next OPW presenter? And if you are, come through for auditions. But I particularly remember vividly hearing God's voice and telling me to go and audition because that show was mine. But it's not something I could articulate to anybody else, not even him, and yet he was right beside me. A few weeks later, I went for that audition and he was out of town, but he constantly checked up, constantly you know, checked up on how I was feeling, what was happening. And from the time that I told him that I had made it to the stage that would, you know, kind of lead me further on into the competition, his support was tremendous. Um, his mission had always been to see me live my dream. And if he could enable it in any way, he did. If he needed to take me to auditions, he did. If he needed to let me read my lines to him, he did. I remember when I won, I was not allowed to announce it. I was not allowed to tell anyone until such time that, you know, it was out and, and, and broadcasted. But because I was living with him at the time, it really became difficult. And I remember coming home that evening promising myself not to say a word <laughs> because I was legally bound not to. 
Uh, and he took one look at me and he said, you won. I can see it in your eyes. I can feel it in your energy. And I said, well, you're going to just have to wait to find out. I remember on Valentine's Day of 2018, just a few months, just a few months after I started shooting, um, he then, not so romantically though, uh, took me out to dinner and said, like, I'm Oba Malume. And I was like, is that a proposal? <laughs> and um, he's like, that's the best you're going to get. Um, I've been thinking about it and I, I really want to make you my wife. Uh, I think we've been doing this for a long time and I think the timing is right. It's right for both of us. And I, I obliged, I agreed. So on the 18th of August, 2018, I had... Uh, or rather his family came through uh, to mine in the Eastern Cape and the Lobalo negotiations were done. And uh, I remember feeling a different kind of happiness. Like it was a, it was like a relief, uh, like everything we'd worked towards was culminating in that day. I remember feeling really happy and excited about the future. And I remember also, you know, speaking to my uncles as they came in and out, you know, cause I'm not allowed to be a part of the negotiations, but I was intrigued about what was going on. And I remember my uncle saying to me when, when it was done, he said to me, yeah, he's worked hard. You've got the right one. He's worked hard. He, he wants you, he wants you. And, um, I've never felt anything like that. It, 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 it made me whole, it made me, um, and I've had many other experiences that would uh, make me feel that way, but that one was different. That one kind of said, it's all coming full circle. And I really believed that I was deserving of it. So I didn't know um, I was pregnant until like two and a half months into it because of the new job that I was in. I was traveling a lot and I was kind of literally in the rush of it all. And then I think I went on a production break and that gave me some time at home. And I realized something was different. Something was different about me. Something was different about my body. And I told him, uh, I'm suspecting, <laughs> I think I may be pregnant. Um, but I suppose the only way to find out is if we go and test. And, uh, we went out for breakfast. I think it was a Monday morning. We had gone for breakfast and I went to buy this test, went home, did the test and, um, it came out positive. I think at the time I must've been like five to six weeks pregnant. Whew. I bawled my eyes out. <laughs> I cried. I cried because I thought, no, man, this is not the time. Uh, I want to be living out my dream. I still want to, you know, be on stages, be on screen. Yes, I love him. And yes, I'm ready to spend, you know, most of my life with him or the rest of my life with him. But I wasn't sure if a kid was really part of the plan at the time. Him, on the other hand, well, he was ecstatic. He thought, what better way to begin life together? He had already made the commitment. So this was just the perfect addition to, to, to the life that he, he wanted to have with me. So when my water broke, it must have been around 1 a.m. on the 27th of September, 2018. I remember feeling quite restless that evening. Uh, not in any pain, but kind of restless. And um, I went to the bathroom, came back from the bathroom, and this gush of water just came out. We we had made a decision that we were going to record every part you of the journey. You can speak to you guys. <laughs> You're with the packing. <laughs> wow. So you just want to come in? So he captured all of that. I was taken into theater and uh, he shot everything. <laughs> got
got to cut the baby's umbilical cord as soon as he was born. Our little bundle of of joy, Uzuko, was born at uh, 12 midday on the 27th of September, 2018. Um, around March, April 2018, I was, I was cast to, to be a part of a new production. And I started shooting that production around June uh, the 9th or somewhere, I think a week before our accident. And um, I remember feeling so excited to be back on screen. I mean, I'd been a mom for most of the time that I had left OPW until that time that I got the new role. So it was really kind of an exciting time for me in my career to get the opportunity to be back on screen. And I had been shooting for about a week. And on that Friday before the car accident, uh, I fell asleep, heard him come home. And um, I think we had a bit of a chat. He had bought some pizza and we had a bit of a moment with him trying to make me taste this pizza. But it was too late and, uh, you know, we soon went to bed and it was the next day. The next day I had quite a lot of errands to run and one of them was attending a baby shower. But we knew that we we had a, um, a function to attend together in later that very same evening. And we had agreed that, you know, upon my return home, we would uh, jump into one car and, and drive to this event together. Um, I remember leaving the event. I remember leaving and saying our goodbyes to everyone. And we got into the car. But I remember also feeling very exhausted. It had been a draining week. I just returned to set and it was quite late in the early hours of the morning. And so I fell asleep. I fell asleep. And uh, I remember waking up to like the sound of sirens. It felt like I was in a dream because I remember feeling very, like, so out of touch. It was almost like a bad nightmare because I could hear the sirens, I could see them, but I could also see the flames of our car, you know, burning up. But I think I passed out and, uh, you know, I must have been uh, unconscious again soon after that. And um, I'm not too sure what was done by the paramedics and whoever else was there. But I woke up uh, in casualty in hospital with him by my side. And... Um, with commotion, the doctors, the paramedics, and anyone really who needed to be there to, to attend to us. And it was then um, when I asked, where are we and, and what's happened? I was then informed uh, by the doctors that we'd been in a car accident, where we were, which hospital we were at, and that we were quite injured and that he needed me to stay still, stay calm as much as I can. But I looked to my right and my husband was hysterical, uh, fighting off uh, literally anyone he could fight off. He didn't want to be touched. He didn't want to be touched and attended to. He just kept on screaming my name and screaming my name. And I tried so hard to let him know that I was right beside him 
um, I was right beside him and that he needed to calm down, that everyone was just trying to help us. We're going to be okay. I said those words to him. It's only then when it dawned upon me that perhaps no one even knows what's happened. Um, I asked if anyone had picked up our belongings and no one could uh, find any of them. So I asked one of the doctors to borrow me a phone so I could call my mother. And so I did. And she was the first person who was informed by me what had happened. And she, she rushed through to the hospital. When she arrived, she arrived to me awake. I remember her arriving and she asked me what I remember. And I told her I don't remember anything. I fell asleep in the car. And she asked where they had taken Farai. I told her that I didn't know, but he had not been in a good state when I last saw him. She then went on to kind of, you know, find the doctors to be acquainted with 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 our progress and um after that it was it was pretty much a, a blur for me too because i was soon uh sedated and um prepared for surgery as well as i had sustained major injuries as well that week after was I've never begged so much for something to happen. I was told that he was not doing okay. But as the week progressed, I kept being told that he's he's getting better. He's better than yesterday. He's looking better today. When he hears your name, he squeezes. <sighs> I was told that when he'd hear my name, he would react. So much so that, um, my father-in-law and my brother-in-law spoke to my doctors that could I at least be wheeled in my bed to him because they just didn't know what could be done to, to save him and if there was a chance at all that if he heard my voice, then we needed to do that. And so I was taken to him. And when I got to him, I I just told him to wake up. I just could not understand why he would not wake up. Because I was here. Yes, I was badly hurt, badly injured and battered. But I knew I was going to be okay. I knew I was going to make it. My mind was working. Everything was functioning. And I needed to know that he could be the same. I asked him, I begged him to just wake up. That's the only thing. I just asked him to wake up. The rest will heal. You know, we were both broken and, you know, the doctor's reports were saying we're fractured here, we're fractured there. But I just knew that if he could wake up, we're one step ahead. Bones can, can come back. Bones can, you know, come back together anytime. But I needed to hear him talk. And um, I was taken back to my room. And like I say, the week progressed and I kept being told about his progress. And um, when my family would not be around to come and tell me of his progress, because it was literally in and out. He was in ICU and I was in a different uh, high critical care ward. Um, so there was always an exchange of them coming to see us. And if it wasn't my family, I was constantly asking the nurses to please check on my husband. What are his doctors saying? And um, it was really a, a week of of hope, of of itemba. I just stand in itemba. I really wanted um, him to survive. 
So I remember that on the 22nd of June, it was a Saturday. And as usual, we had family and friends come through to visit us, bring us things that we needed. And that evening, uh, on the last visit, I saw a very different, I suppose, look or sadness in my brother-in-law and my father-in-law's eyes. And I know now why, because they had been there all night after they had been told that he was deteriorating. This was obviously kept for me, and I presume because they wanted to protect me from it or protect me from worrying as I also needed to, to, to recuperate and, and focus on my healing. <laughs> but as soon as the visiting hours had ended at around, if I'm not mistaken, visiting hours ended around six and the doctors had just done their rounds to come and give me medication and just eat and supper. And I was slowly, you know, dozing off. And I heard a voice, I heard a voice say to me, he's gone. And I thought, I was dreaming. I thought. I thought I was dreaming. And when I opened up my eyes, it was my brother-in-law stand, standing beside me, crying. And I said, did you say something? What's going on? And he said, Farai is gone. My heart literally stopped because I think I wanted to know what he meant by gone. Is he gone to another hospital? What do you mean he's gone? But I think I knew what he meant. Uh, I'm not sure what happened in that moment because... Everything just became so numb. Everything just became so black, so black. And uh, I think the rest of my family was called back to come and attend to me because I think I scram for the whole ward to hear me. Um... My mother then arrived back with my aunt and my brothers and many other people who had already been visiting us. And I begged for them not to take him away before I had gotten a chance to see him. And so again, the decision was made that I would be wheeled with my bed or rather in my bed to him. That's something I'll never forget for the rest of my life. <sighs> Him lying there still. <sighs> and cold. I begged him not to do this to me. I begged him, I begged him not to go. I said a lot of things, I said a lot of things. I remember even saying how, you know, I promised I would raise our son to the best of my ability, but really, I didn't know what to say. I honestly didn't know what to say. 
how do you sit beside the love of your life and you accept that he's gone? But I knew that I didn't want to let go. I needed to say something, do something. I even at some point wanted to jump onto him and breathe life into him. But I couldn't. And, um, and so I said my goodbyes. And he was soon uh, taken away. And um, that was the beginning of life without him. Mama. What? I need to be myself again. You're gonna be yourself again. Say hi. Say hi. I say hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. How are you feeling? Getting there much better. Yes. Day by day. Okay, so. Okay. When we came back from the funeral, I think is when I really felt support and uh, backing of my family and my friends and most certainly of South Africa. I probably would have never made it without the support of my family. My mother. <laughs> I could see she was taking strength. Having to take care of me and my little eight-month-old baby. But she did it with such grace. And with such commitment and with so much love. I remember bawling my eyes out and she looked at me and she said, I wish I could take away your pain. She wished. She wished she really could do something, but there really was nothing except just being there in whatever way she could. And I think the immediate way she could be there for me at the time was to nurture me back to, to, to you know, my full health because I could not walk, I could not drive, I could not bath myself. Um, everything that we consider normal and with the rest of my family, you know, it took so much of them to go all the way to Zimbabwe, to bury my husband, to come back and have to deal with every other challenge that I was faced with. But they were relentless in their support. They never tired and they never, you know, grew weary. And I'm extremely, extremely grateful for them because they are the reason I am standing here today to tell the story, their love and their support has meant everything to me. It's literally brought me back to life. <sighs> yeah. And now it's a year later, after that dreadful day, when I thought my life was cushioned and I thought my life was somewhat perfect, perfect enough for me. And it's been by far the toughest journey I've walked. I've cried, I've laughed. I've broken down, I've come back up, I've walked a few miles, then walked a few back. I've literally done anything under the sun to try and find meaning to what life is after this. What do I do now? Where do I begin now? And I can say I don't have it figured out. I really don't, but I want to be better. I want to know that there's so much more that lies in my future because he would want that for me. 
It's taken a lot to get there. It hasn't been easy. Sometimes I didn't want to get out of bed. Sometimes I didn't want to put up a smile and say life is going to be okay because honestly nothing was okay. But I'm at a place now that is ready, is ready to to begin the journey of healing. I'm at a place of wanting to more than anything because I think for the longest time I had held on to the pain and thinking that that is what I deserve and that is where I need to be always. But I now understand that I, I'm worthy of I'm worthy of the joy that lies in the future. I'm worthy of giving myself the life that I've always wanted to have. And I'm ready to accept that he will always be with me. He will always be in uh, our lives, you know, directing it from a different path, directing it in a different way. And so I bring you After Dark with Gaiese. And I've called it After Dark with Gaiese because It is after the darkest moment in my life. I've been through many moments in my life when I thought I would not rise from this, but they were nothing compared to this, nothing compared to, to literally walking in darkness and trying to find just even the little bit of light. The show would be a conversational series that will be dedicated to healing I want to provide a platform to have conversations with people about the experiences that they've had with dark periods in their life. It's about continually saying we may not know what lies ahead, but we're ready and we're willing to accept um, any form of healing and any form of, um, I suppose, light that will come our way. And so, Fari, for Lord, this is for you. Through you, I hope to bring purpose to a lot of people. I hope to bring healing to a lot of people. Our story has touched millions. And that speaks testament to the kind of man you were. That even in your death, you touch souls. With this, I say thank you. Thank you for giving me the best years of my life. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you for being my heart. I love you. I'm a